So welcome to everybody joining today. Um, this is a, a very special um, Bonavero Institute in Oxford Business and Human Rights Research Network webinar. Uh, it's entitled Outsourcing and Oversight, How Market Regulation Failure and the Culture of Laissez-faire Led to the Exploitation of Those Who Guard Our Embassies Abroad. Uh, we're very fortunate today to have Dr. James Sinclair with us. He holds a PhD in International Human Rights Law and Political Economy from, the, from King's College in London. James is also a qualified barrister specializing in international litigation. In 2006, he co-founded FSI Worldwide, a UN award-winning labor, uh, fair labor organization, which operates in 10 countries and has offered uh, protected employment to thousands of migrants. In the last couple of years, James has been work busy not just working on his um, doctoral project, but also creating the Fair Labor Alliance, which is funded by a grant that was awarded in 2019. Uh, he also leads the FSI uh, consulting practice, and we are very fortunate that he will be sharing with us his cutting edge research today. Um, he, sorry, he, he provides consulting um, services to global companies. Um, Mustafa Kadri is the founder and executive director of Equidem. He is the human rights research and advocacy expert on this panel with 20 years of interdisciplinary experience in government and public international law, journalism, and non-governmental sectors. Um, he is the author of several landmark human rights reports, including The Ugly Side of the Be Beautiful Game. This is the first independent human rights uh, investigation to uncover labor abuse uh, on Qatar's uh, 2022 World Cup construction site. Mustafa has uh, carried out human rights investigations, advocacy training on several countries from Afghanistan to Australia, Bangladesh to the UK. Mustafa is a research fellow at the Institute for Human Rights and Business and a member of the board of directors to the, uh, the core coalition. Elise Gouldix is a um, pioneer in the rapidly developing field of business and human rights. For the last decade, she has advised multinational businesses on how to understand and respect international human rights norms. Elise established and convenes the ABA Center for Human Rights Business and Human Rights Advo uh, Ad Advisory Board project. She's also the chair of the IBA Committee on BHR as an international lawyer and mediator she is often called upon to convene um, groups and individuals in the field of business and human rights. Uh, we're very grateful um, for her time, um, especially because she's joining us from Washington this morning. Uh, Lucas Wilder is the Assistant Professor of International European Law at Utrecht University in the Netherlands and a postdoc um, that specializes in accountability and liability law. Lucas specializes in transnational civil cases concerning hum corporate human rights abuse. He's also got extensive experience on interactions between public international law and private international law and human rights law when they face, uh, when they face adverse human rights impacts by non-state actors. His current research looks at how human rights can be better integrated into liability regimes governing private conduct, especially con conduct by transnational corporations. So that's all that you will probably hear from me uh, for the rest of the session. Um, I'm looking forward to the discussion very much and encourage the audience to participate by asking questions using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. We will also get to your questions once we have heard from all the panelists, but our panelists have, will have the option to answer your questions throughout the event. So if we don't get to address it live, you may find your answers in written form. Now, I'm going to hand over to James now for his presentation. Um, James, you have about half an hour, and then uh, we will go to each of the panelists um, uh, after that. So thank you very much. Thanks, Lisa, that's really kind. Um, and thanks to the Bonavero Institute for, for hosting the event today um, and for inviting me. This is my first um, talk post my, my PhD, so it's a real honor to be here. Um, for those of you who like a structured PowerPoint presentation, I'm afraid I'm going to have to disappoint you. Uh, I have a pathological hatred of PowerPoint. So I, I, I'm going to just talk for, for half an hour and try to sketch out some of the key aspects of, of the research that I've been doing over the last five years or so, um, and, and ask essentially four questions. What's the problem? Why is it problematic? How did we get to where we are? And how can we try to solve the problems in a better way going forward? 
but before I get into, into that, I want just to situate a little bit more of why I did this research and, and, and set out a little bit more of, of my background, if that's not too self-indulgent. Um, so I, as Lisa kindly said, I, I started life as a, as, a, as a barrister 20 years ago. I spent five years or so in private practice. And then um, I met a, a guy called Tristan Forster. Uh, and the reason I met Tristan was I was playing in a band with his brother. I was, I'm, I was then, remain now a drummer. And we started talking about the job that Tristan was then doing. Uh, he had spent 12 years in the army as a Gurkha officer. He'd retired as a major in the Gurkha regiment in 2001. And by 2004, five, six, he was, um, he was back in Iraq and he was there as part of the private security industry and the, the many tens of indeed hundreds of thousands of, of contractors that had been drawn back into that theater of war uh, after their, their military careers. And we got talking about some of the things that he was seeing and experiencing. And obviously at that time, Iraq was a, was a very difficult place to be. But one of his particular concerns was the treatment of migrant workers and the way in which particularly ex-Gurkha and other ex-military people were being treated during the course of their recruitment and employment in places like Iraq and Afghanistan. And so we talked about what that problem was and I'll, I'll come on to what I define the problem to be in just a second. And we looked at the various political and legal and other avenues there might be to try to attack, attack this problem. And we pr pretty quickly concluded that there wasn't anything useful that could be done other than um, setting up our own ethical recruitment company. And so in a, um, a fit of unbridled enthusiasm, we decided to set up uh, FSI, which um, has a very simple mission, which is that everyone, no matter whether they are an unskilled migrant worker or an engineer working in the global north, everyone has the right to respect and fair treatment as an employee and as a recruit. And so we set up this small recruitment company in Nepal and, and in India and an operations company in the Gulf. And we started recruiting ex-military people in the way that you or I might like to be recruited. They don't pay for their jobs. They are told exactly what their job is going to be and where it is going to be. They're given the risks of that job. They are paid in full and on time every month. They're insured well, they're managed well. And none of this is or should be rocket science, but it is tragically still quite unusual in many parts of the world. And that model that we've been working on now for over 15 years is what we call fair labor. The idea that everyone has a fair go. And, and as I say, it, 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 it stands in contradistinction to a lot of the, the practice that exists on the ground. But I want, during my research, I wanted to challenge some of the assumptions around why it is that unfair and unfree labor is the norm. Because there is often a tendency within the global north to assume that this problem is because of you know, corrupt governments or corrupt individuals in developing or global, global South countries. And there's some of that to be sure, but there's a, there's a part of this, which is also our fault. And, I, and that was the bit that really drove me because I spent seven years living and working across the Middle East and South Asia and East Africa. And the more I saw of this problem, the more I saw the sort of complex interplay of culture and finance and politics and, technology and all of the other stuff that goes in to make up this series of problems. I kept getting one question back in my mind. Why is it, why is it that the people who are being exploited here are so close to the governments of people like of countries like the UK who, who, who openly profess to want to confront these problems? Why? Why is it that they can't stop their outsourced contracting companies from treating their workers in this way. And, and the more that question rattled around my head, the more I was drawn back to the, the idea of coming back to London and researching this, this problem in a more sort of robust and academically um, sort of uh, methodologically sound way. So that I hope gives you some idea of why I did this. That brings me to the question, 
Question number one, what's the problem? And I'll come on in a minute because this is ultimately a law, a law session to talk about definitions. We love a good definition, so I'll come to that in a minute. But if I was asked to put in layman's terms, what is the problem? The problem is this, people paying for jobs. In its most basic form, that's the problem. Now, when you put it like that, it doesn't sound like a problem, really. A lot of people would say, so what? You know, a bit of money changes hands, someone gets a job, fine. Well, I don't think it is fine. And I'll, I'll go on to explain in my second question why it isn't fine and the harms that are associated with this. But let me just expand a little on, the, on this question of paying for jobs. Because we're not just talking about a few quid, a few dollars. We are talking about the systematic industrialized exploitation of vulnerable workers to a very significant financial degree. We're talking about the payment of somewhere between $1,500 and $6,000 for a job. And this is being charged to people who often have very little or nothing. So it won't surprise you to hear that most of the people who are accessing jobs through this system cannot afford to pay in cash. Some of them, about 20 or 25%, can raise the money through land sales or jewelry sales or money from the community. But the vast majority have to take a loan. And those loans are organized by people close to the agents and the, 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 their sub-agents who then charge very high rates of interest on those loans. So you have a section, several harms, layer upon layer. You have a debt being incurred by a worker who essentially would struggle to pay it. You have interest rates being loaded onto that debt. Um, and you have a network of agents and fixers throughout the, the, this, this whole process who are ensnaring these people. And we're talking about you know, the vast majority of people who are recruited in many, part, many parts of the global South are being recruited through these systems. I'm just gonna pause there for one second, just to note something. And this is troubling in some respects. The practices I'm describing are often not seen by the people involved as problematic, including the people who are paying the money. They may see a sub-agent who is a friend or even a family member of theirs living in their village or the next village along as someone who is trying to help them get work. They may not fully understand the implications of what they're signing up to. They may or may not, I don't want to rob them of their agency, but they certainly don't often view this as a problematic thing. Many of the agents in the process see it as just a normal part of life. But as I'll talk about in my third question, it wasn't always so. It has become a normal part of life over the last 25 years, and very largely on our watch. So um, what we have is, is, is largely ungoverned spaces facilitating the sort of industrialized exploitation of workers. And that has now become a thoroughly established social, economic, and quasi-legal norm. And that norm is, provide, is proving very sticky, very hard to unpick. So it's, it's illegal, but it's very widespread. Now, I'm just gonna say something here about definitions because much as I don't wanna to get too hung up on definitions, it's important. Um, and I'm gonna start at the sort of macro level, and then I'm gonna drill down into some of the issues. But at the macro level, the thing that we're describing has come to be known as a form of modern slavery. Now, modern slavery is a term I don't especially like. It, it in my view, closes as many doors as it opens. It has, it brings into question a, a, um, a victim agency, if victim is the right word I'm looking for. It brings into question um, uh, uh, the, the, the transatlantic slave trade and, and comparisons with that, which a lot of people find distasteful. Um, so, but it is a term that nonetheless has become quite well established. So let's stick with it for now. Um, modern slavery is essentially just an umbrella term, an umbrella term for a series of, of, of concepts that live below it. 
One of them, perhaps the most significant, is forced labour. And forced labour is a, a term that was defined by the ILO in 1930 or 29, which, um, which it, if I, I'm being incredibly reductive here, but essentially describes a situation in which someone is working under the threat of penalty or menace. And that can be anything across a, a spectrum from insecure and threatened employment to what we would readily recognize as a slavery um, situation. So that's forced labor. We have things like um, child labor, which um, mercifully is well beyond the scope of this, this lecture because it's quite a complex issue and, and would require several hours of analysis on all its own. Um, we have things like human trafficking, which is a, a related concept basically involves the movement of people with the intention of exploiting them. And then we come to something called bonded labor and debt bondage. And those two concepts are slightly different, but they're often used interchangeably. And that is, or at least a version of it, what we're talking about today. Now, bonded labor was, was a term that, they, that was sort of defined in the 1950s as, as the act of somebody working to pay off a debt or somebody nominating someone else to work to pay off a debt for them. But it, that, that definition doesn't quite cut it, at least not in this scenario, because that's not really what we're talking about. And so the idea of debt bondage and bonded labor has sort of grown and it's, and it's evolved to, to recognize this state of affairs in which workers have no choice but to put themselves in very large amounts of debt in order to access the job market. So that sort of debt bondage scenario is, is sort of what we talk about. If there is one other slight definitional distinction I want to make at this point, which I, in, in my thesis, I, I, dis, I, I describe two types of debt bondage situations. One is what I call the pure, pure exploitation model. And one is what I've perhaps confusingly called the lessee model. It sounds like an Australian sheepdog, but it's, it's labor exploitation in the security industry. And they're different, I, I think they're materially different concepts. I want to explain just very quickly why. So um, the pure exploitation model doesn't really start in the ungoverned spaces in Nepal or in Kenya. It starts in the boardrooms in Qatar and Dubai and, and, and other, other places. And it starts there because that's the point at which the demand is made for the bribe from the labor agent in Kathmandu. They say to these guys, you pay us $500 a man for this 100 man contract and you can have the contract. So the labor agent in Kathmandu pays over his $50,000 and then he has to recover it. And that's not to excuse the actions of the agent. It's just to understand the fact that at the beginning of the process, he, and it's nearly always he, is in debt to begin with, and he has to recover that debt by going through this cycle of exploitation. And when we see that, we start to see that that is a cycle, and it's not just a one-off series of, of bribes. And that money often is spread around law enforcement and other, other forms of agencies to keep this show on the road. And then the pure exploitation model is just, you know, it's, it's, it's I hate to use the term, but sort of cannon fodder. It's, 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 it's low wage, um, low skilled workers being put through the sausage machine, being charged money, ending up on, on, on construction sites. And, and Mustafa will talk much more eloquently about this than I can. Um, and, and, and when they get there, they have very little in the way of rights and very little in the way of, of pushback. They, they are treated very poorly indeed. Lessie describes a slightly different scenario, partly because security guards are often slightly higher skilled, slightly higher um, uh, uh, paid, but they're also, it's more problematic in some ways because they're charged more money because of the higher wages. They are put in situations of extreme uh, danger. So we're talking about Iraq and Afghanistan, embassy guarding positions, for example, where people are, you know, will get shot at at some point, almost certainly. Um, and, and, and there is a relationship between those people and sovereign governments in the West, which is also problematic. So I, I'm, I'm conscious of time, I won't labor that point, but that, there are some interesting definitional uh, uh, um, aspects to this. Question two, why is it problematic? Well, I've got a list of about six things here um, and I'll take them just one by one. Firstly, almost all migrant workers, I think we can probably say all migrant workers are going abroad to send money back to family and uh, communities at home. 
And so when you reduce the amount of money that a migrant worker can send home in their remittance pack, then you are reducing the amount of money that that family and that community has. So there's a direct financial implication. Secondly, I mean, this is in no particular order, by the way. Secondly, it enriches criminal gangs. The people operating this system are by definition operating outside the law, by definition criminal. And the more money these people get, the more power they have, the, more, the less chance there is of challenging their, their activities. There is the third thing, which I think is possibly the most important, which is that by loading this debt obligation onto the back of the workers, you are robbing them of their ability to assert their rights as workers, or at least you're seriously undermining that. Why? Very simply, because once that worker has gone to that work site, is thousands of miles away from friends and family with a debt that they cannot repay, except with the job that they are in at the moment, they cannot and will not complain about their conditions because to do so invites termination. And termination means, the, means real trouble. It means that they cannot repay that debt. If they cannot find another job, they're stuck and their families are stuck and they might lose their houses, they might lose everything. So guess what? They don't complain. And this is one of the reasons why technologies such as Worker Voice, which come into this equation at the point at which the exploitation has already happened, often don't work because you're asking workers to jeopardize everything for the sake of making a complaint, which may or may not work. Um, there's a point about it undermines the rule of law. So the more this, this, this situation is allowed to continue, the less... It damages reputations, government reputation. It damages corporate reputation. We've seen that in 2019, G4S was accused by the Nor Norwegian Sovereign Wealth Fund of overseeing systematic human rights violations in relation to exactly these practices in the Gulf. Big hit to their reputation. One of the other most important aspects of this is that recruitment on the basis of a willingness to pay a bribe rather than merit will result almost inevitably in poor quality uh, or, or mismatched workers for, for jobs. And that might mean in the construction industry, poor quality outcomes, poor productivity outcomes. In the security industry, it might mean that instead of having a highly trained Gurkha on your gate, you've got a goat farmer with a gun. And a goat farmer with a gun in Afghanistan is not good news. So that's, that's a problem. And, and finally, and related to that point, is security risks. So if you've got someone who's poorly trained um, and has got through the process by virtue of being able to pay, there is a risk that they might infiltrate or be able to, to be undermined in, in a security sense. So those are some of the harms. Third point, how do we get here? Well, for this, I need to take you on a bit of a journey. And we're gonna go back to the 1990s and then I'm gonna build back up to where we are now and then start to answer some questions, hopefully in section four, about what we can do. So why, why did all this start? Well, in very broad terms, as all of you will know, um, there were several, several things that happened in the early 90s. The, the first one is that the collapse of the USSR meant that we no longer had a sort of existential um, military power threat across the border. And so military capability shrunk almost everywhere, particularly in the UK. The, UK, the, the British Armed Forces were about half the size now that they were in 1990. Now, um, what that meant was that the Ministry of Defence didn't have the capability or the capacity to assist other agencies such as the FCO when in their hour of need. They were stripped right back to the, to the bone. At the same time as that military retrenchment and related to it, although slightly coincidental, was the rise and the, at that point, the absolute ascendancy of this neoliberal philosophy of government. You know, government should do less. They should outsource more, they should privatize more. Government's only job is to get out of the way or at least hold the ring and then get out of the way. And what that led to, of course, was a diminution in, in the willingness and capability of the state to intervene. And these two things intersected at the end of the 90s. A smaller state, a less capable, less, um, a state with, with less capability uh, and, 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 le and fewer military assets coincided at the end of the 90s. And then, of course, 9-11 happened. And very quickly, the UK finds itself fighting two wars, in Afghanistan initially and then Iraq massive military overstretch. And in 2002, the FCO decides 
quite rightly, that it needs a bridgehead. It needs to be back in carbon. It had closed its embassy in carbon in 1979 when the Soviets invaded. It needed to be back in there. But how does it go back in? It's going to put a, a building there, which is going to be the, the, one of the biggest targets for military uh, or paramilitary attack anywhere in the world. It needs security. But the MOD no longer has the capability to provide that security. So inevitably, and bearing in mind that the sort of paradigm um, shift, inevitably, the reaction is it goes to the market and it goes out to armor group, it goes to, Iraq, it goes to Nepal and it, it, it recruits 300 Gurkhas to come and look after the, the embassy. Now we discovered several years later when the, these, these projects were being audited that that process of recruitment had been heavily um, uh, infiltrated by these sorts of bonded labor practices. So I'm gonna just pause that, that sort of global North perspective for a second and take you to Nepal and explain what was going on in Nepal in those years. Because it, it might be thought that Nepal has always been a labor source country. It's always been a country where people go abroad for work, but that isn't true. Until the 1996 civil war, the Maoist civil war erupted, very few people traveled abroad for work other than across the porous border with India. We're talking about 1500 people a year. So um, what that meant was that uh, there was no real industry for governing how people went abroad. And the only law that was in place to, to try to govern this was the 1985 Foreign Employment Act, which was a very, very sketchy, very basic law, which really didn't provide for any form of meaningful uh, oversight. And that was the paradigm in which Armour Group was then recruiting in 2002, 2003, 2004. Um, so what then happened in the sort of early 2000s was this industry of exploitation grew up. And this social norm, this commercial norm of, of exploitation became embedded. And there was a recognition within the Nepali political classes that this was happening. And to their credit, they legislated. They legislated far earlier than we did it in the Global North. 2007, they passed the, the updated, massively updated Foreign Employment Act, which is actually as you read it, a, a very good joined up piece of legislation which should provide for the meaningful protection of migrant workers. But of course, by that point, the government is fighting a rear guard action. It is, it is trying to put a genie back into the bottle. It's trying to challenge a social norm that's become so embedded, particularly in the ungoverned spaces, that it's almost impossible. And that is a law that has been widely um, disregarded as a result. So, um, we then have this boom period, both for the, for the recruitment industry, but also for the, for the recruits themselves. Between 2004 and 2008, basic security guards on embassy, embassy gates were earning $2,500 to $2,500 a month, which when you compare it to the $400 a year that was then the average wage in Nepal, is extremely attractive. But this, of course, created the honeypot. It created the incentive systems. And some people might say, I wouldn't, but some people might, that it's less problematic if you're charged $5,000, if the job you're getting is paying $30,000. Well, of course, what happened next was the global financial crisis, the change towards a more competitive and austere contracting environment in the US, several other bits and pieces, led to a point where in 2008, 2009, wages for guards collapsed. And so instead of earning two or two and a half thousand dollars a month, they were earning four, five, six, seven, eight hundred dollars a month. But the fees they were having to pay to get those jobs didn't change. So instead of paying five thousand dollars for a thirty thousand dollar a year job, you were paying five thousand dollars for an eight thousand dollar a year job, which is a different sort of thing. So I'm conscious of time. I was going to talk a little bit of, as question four. How can we fix it? Well, we tried to some extent to sort of put the genie back in the bottle from the global north end. From 2010 onwards, we've seen a series of legislative in, uh, interventions. Began with the 2010 California Transparency and Supply Chains Act, the UK Bribery Act, which came into force in 2011, the uh, President Obama's executive order of 2012, the changes to the federal acquisition regulations in 2013, the Modern Slavery Act of 2015, the French duty of vigilance law in 2017, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We, we're starting to see a sort of development of the law but no real change. 
And that's largely because most of this law, as I see it, is what I would call trophy legislation. It's, it's, it's pass it, take the credit for it, don't look too hard, and don't realize that actually it's not really changing anything at the grassroots. And, and one of the things I want to come and talk about just very quickly in a second is public procurement and the importance of public procurement and the role of government as rule setter and buyer, because that's critical. But in addition to this sort of legislative spree, we saw a, a massive increase in civil society action. Business and human rights became a thing. Um, strategic litigation, which Lucas will come and talk about in a second, it, it became a thing. Um, but all the while, it, there was no, there's no, been no real change on the ground. And so my final point is going to be about public procurement. And I promise I'll shut up and let someone else talk. Um, someone else has probably got a better handle on it than I have. But um, why is public procurement so, so critical to this? Well, partly it's because it talks to exactly these sort of shifts, these political economy shifts. You know, we've gotten used to this idea that government cannot, should not intervene in markets. That I think is now being challenged. I think Carillion was a big moment in the UK. Those of you in the UK will, will, may remember a few years ago, Carillion, massive government outsourcing company worth apparently tens of billions of, of pounds signed off by one of the big four accountants, still getting money from the government in the week before it collapsed, went overnight into insolvency. And not just, in, not just administration, liquidation overnight, because it had been so stripped of its assets by this sort of redundant business model of, um, of hyper state uh, shareholder capitalism. It didn't have, even have enough reserves to pay for its auditors, uh, it, it, its administrators. And that I think was a wake up call to government because this wasn't just any company. It was a company that was charged with running some critical national infrastructure, feeding children in schools, keeping prisoners in, 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 in prisons. You know, this, this, this is not small stuff. So I think there was a bit of a moment there and, and, and a realization that this 40 year drift towards the smaller and smaller and smaller and, and less and less capable state has to end. Partly the reason why governments are so attracted to the idea of outsourcing and privatization, outsourcing in particular, is because it gives them a veneer of, um, uh, or gives them a, a, a sense of distance from, from, from any, pro any problems that might arise. If, you, if, if your outsourcing provider, if the blood is on their hands, if I can put it bluntly, then it's better than it being on your hands, right? Because the economic case for outsourcing has only ever always been marginal. There was a very interesting report, or for those of you who'll find these things interesting, interesting report from the Institute for Government a few years ago, which looked at the savings from outsourcing. And there's this, 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 this statistic, which is often trotted out by government ministers to say that outsourcing is 25 to 30% more efficient financially or economically than in-house provision by government. That statistic is bunk, right? It, it refers to a single one-off period in the 90s when there was a lot of low hanging fruit, and a lot of, in, a lot of uh, uh, efficiencies that could be made. Since then, the numbers are more like two, two and a half, three, four, five percent maximum. And in many cases, it's not more efficient at all as the state has become more efficient at what it does. So the economic case has always been marginal. The political case is quite strong because of this deflection of, of, of blame. But that deflection of blame comes at a very high price. And in this case, we're talking about the price of, of workers, you know, on, with guns, on gates, in British embassies who have been exploited. I think that's a price that's too high and, and one we shouldn't pay. So I guess my conclusion to all of this has been, you know, let's, let's think again about the role of the state in all of this. Let's be more muscular, let's be more aggressive. Let's, let's make sure that our contractors are held to account properly because there's nothing necessarily wrong with outsourcing in, the, in, in, in certain circumstances, as long as it is accompanied by a meaningful and effective oversight mechanism. You can do that, then we're talking. Um, but the, the, the situation as it is at the moment is, is not sustainable. I would just say this one thing as a, as a, as a last note, hopefully of, of cheer, which is that in 2019, the, the, the government in the UK central contracting authority issued a guidance note to all procurement bodies across the government, which was specifically about modern slavery. And it's really well written. It gets that this is a this is a risk management exercise. It's an it, it's a targeted exercise, and and it's about making sure that due diligence is not just the preserve of, of, of the private sector, but is done by government appropriately and effectively when you need to. Because the government cannot, at the top, say we don't like modern slavery, and yet keep giving contracts 
to low price, low quality contractors who frankly are the problem. So with that, um, I will shut up and uh, let others talk. But thank you very much for your, your attention. Thank you so much, James. That was a really wonderfully comprehensive overview of uh, a very important but often very overlooked problem. And as you say, the government takes this hands-off approach. In fact, it's, it's very much neck deep in public procurement and a consumer. Um, so I would love to understand a little bit more about the sort of the scale up of the problem. And I think it's the right time to pass over to Mustafa, who can probably give us a bit of insight on that. Thank you, Lisa. And uh, particularly thank you to James for, um, you know, quite frankly, what I think is just the beginning of the story. Um, I know I've worked on these issues and documenting the situation for migrant workers, including security guards for um, a fairly long time. But there's a lot, even in that short half an hour period that I learned uh, from James. So I really look forward to hearing more from what he has to say and, and also from, from the audience. Um, so I, I won't take too long uh, to, to speak, but just to say, firstly, my name is Mustafa Khandri. Uh, I'm the founder and uh, head of an organization called Equidem, which is a, a labor rights and human rights organization. Um, we're relatively unique in that um, all our research is actually carried out by rights holders themselves. And we do a lot of work on the situation of migrant workers in the Gulf countries, where all of our researchers are themselves migrant workers. Um, so uh, I just wanted to briefly speak about um, some of the situations that we've uncovered, um, we've documented in the security sector, which really kind of um, emphasizes in many ways the points that James so eloquently raised. So I'm just going to share with you um, a very quick couple of uh, PowerPoint slides. Um, hopefully, James, you don't get too offended. Um, but these ones are more visual than uh, the, the, the standard ones that we, we usually get. Um, so just bear with me one sec while I put those on. So um, like I said, so our organization, um, we do a lot of work on the situation of migrant workers, particularly in the Gulf states. And the security sector is one that we've documented for quite some time. To first reflect on some of the things that James spoke about, um, to me, there were a number of things, but there were a couple of phrases that you used, James, which I thought were really powerful and quite on point. One was this concept of the industry of exploitation, that the industry is built on the back of exploiting workers. It's not just a unfortunate side um, impact of, of this industry that's very much built on that. One other thing I thought that you said, which is very powerful, was the, the point about debt bondage, that there's a problem inherently in making people pay for work. And whilst you know, certainly myself, before I did this work as well, many of us might feel this is a really mundane issue. In fact, this is where the problem starts for workers because they're effectively in a situation where they cannot um, complain about this situation financially or in other respects. Now, last year, we did a lot of research, Equidem, on how the coronavirus pandemic globally is impacting migrant workers. And we did quite a major study looking at the three largest economies in the Gulf states. And one thing that really came out of that was that security workers were both really essential to providing many of the services during this difficult time while at the same time being amongst the most exploited workers. And so what I've got here is a couple of testimonies of workers um, that we spoke to, our team spoke to about some of the situations that they faced. And whilst you're reading that, just a couple of other things to really note really quickly. Firstly is the security sector is one that employs not just men, although most of them tend to be men, but also women. Um, and that means also that there's a really strong gender component to what workers face. Security guards, yes, but they do other really critical functions. And at the same time, they're not in a very powerful position to negotiate about their conditions. The other thing is that these workers often come from practically every part of the world. So James mentioned uh, workers who come from Nepal. Nepal is a very big source country for the security sector. But in fact, they come from across South Asia, um, Southeast Asia, Africa, as well as the Middle East. And one thing that we've really noticed in our work is there's a real strong racialization in the way that this sector operates. So that, for example, in the Gulf context, it's quite common for workers from 
because it's a majority Muslim countries, that the, the slightly more senior workers uh, or the police force um, uh, employees tend to come from migrant worker countries, which are majority Muslim, places like Pakistan, Syria, Lebanon, those sorts of places. Um, and then other functions are provided by workers from Kenya or African countries or from other South Asian countries. And so there's a really strong sense of a social stratification of the situation that workers face. You know, there were some posts put on social media um, about 10 years ago when the Bahraini authorities were cracking down on um, civil protests over there, where the protesters were speaking to the, the security forces in Urdu, one of the languages of Pakistan, because the security forces were from Pakistan. Um, and the authorities in Bahrain deliberately hired uh, uh, workers who were from a, a Sunni Muslim um, sectarian background because most of the protesters were Shia. And so what you get then is these security guards are looking for a job. Often the pay is a bit, a bit better for those kind of roles than other positions, but then they're actually thrust into these really challenging situations. But beyond even that kind of that political play, there is just the basic situation of, as James mentioned, modern slavery aspect to it. And so you can see here with a number of quotes um, that we've got from workers that the kinds of situations that we see time and time again from workers that are employed by very, very successful companies, often worth hundreds of millions of dollars or billions of dollars, some of them have even been bought by equity recently, is that they don't get paid on time or they don't get paid at all, that they have to do very long hours and, and often uh, are not allowed any kind of breaks, that they're placed in the most high risk of situations. And also that has significant psychosocial impacts on them. And of course, many workers will actually face very serious problems, such as serious health problems or even death from the work that they do. And so that's something that we've documented. And it's really important to stress, we're not just talking here about one company or one sector or even one geography, but across many different geographies. Um, so, um, just with the lot of time that we have, I'll leave it there. But just to say again, with James, thank you for um, the really important research that you've done. Um, and again, to really emphasize that in many ways, I think these are issues that some of us have been documenting for a long time. But the research James has done is really, really quite significant because what it does, which I think many of us wish we could have actually done that, I'm not sure if I could do what James has done, is to really bring those pieces together and to really emphasize the point that the security sector is one that deserves particular attention. And I, I really like, you know, just in ending the point you made, James, about, you know, countries like the United Kingdom have been real leaders in terms of legislation and international advocacy on modern slavery. And yes, they continue and yet they continue to hire companies, even British companies that are seriously involved in modern slavery and forced labor in the security sector. And so that real hypocrisy, we need to challenge that. Um, and so thank you, James, for that really important work you've done to, to highlight that. Thank you so much, Mustafa. That was a really sort of close look into the security industry, which I sort of don't know much about. So thank you for painting such a vivid picture for us. Um, I'm going to zoom out slightly now and invite Elise to give us a few comments on the other piece that James touched on, which is business and human rights. So Elise, over to you. Having a pop. Can you hear me now? Good. So um, the question that I want to ask and answer to what James has been talking about is how does the law bring solution to what he calls market regulation failures? In his thesis, he says the time period under examination runs from 2000 to 2020. During this time, the legal and policy environment surrounding global labor exploitation has advanced significantly in many countries, including the UK and Nepal. However, the thesis concludes that improvements in recruitment and management practices for third country nationals, or what he called TNCs, have not kept pace with the development of relevant law, policy, and ethical norm. So the question is, is it a problem of law or is it a problem of law enforcement? And I would answer it is both. It, pert it pertains to both laws and enforcement. Um, 
James went over all the legislation and and norms that were adopted in the period, we could go back to 1998, 2000, when uh, people started being recruited and there was almost no legislation. And then some legislation took place, even though we did have all along the ILO core convention, but you all know that uh, they're not being enforced in the way we would want to see them enforced. Then we had the VPs in 2000, the Voluntary Principle on Security and Human Rights, and then we had the Montreux document, um, and then we had the ICOCA code, and then came 2005. I mean, Montreux was 2008, but in 2005, uh, John Ruggie was appointed by the Secretary General of the time, Kofi Annan, to oversee the problem and try to get some consensus in proposing some solutions to what uh, I would call a universe that's developing with a lot of norms, a lot of issues, a lot of laws, but it's a complete patchwork. And we're trying to make sense of that global patchwork of legislation. So we got to 2008 when we had the three pillar framework, protect, respect, and remedy, which imposed and uh, I mean, which reinstated the obligation of state to protect human rights, of corporations to respect human rights, and for both state and corporation to remedy the, um, the, the abuse. And the, that framework was adopted unanimously at the UN Council of the, of the um, in Geneva, the UN Council of the Council for Human Rights. And then in 2011, the UN GPs were adopted also unanimously. And in, um, at the same time, in 2011, the OECD guidelines came out. And all both the UNGPs and the OECD guidelines incorporated the ILO core convention. So that patchwork, I mean, takes various form, various type of legislation. James mentioned what happened in France. I mean, the UK, US, California. We also have in the US an important measure uh, designed by the Custom and Border Patrol, which has the capacity to impound shipment and forces negotiation with suppliers, which is different from the system in the UK, but it's acting at the border, at the entry of products. And that was adopted by the under the Obama administration in 2015. It's producing some interesting, um, some interesting results. What we also have is the US-EU conflict mineral, and we have the Dutch child labor that was adopted in 2019, but only comes into force in 2022. And the, the cherry on the Sunday right now, that patchwork is the European mandatory human rights environmental due diligence framework, resolution adopted by an immense majority of the European Parliament in March, 2021, moving towards a directive promised for 2021. So the, the result of that patchwork of legislation is not proposing a coherent legal approach, different laws and different jurisdiction, different focus, different framework, different enforcement mechanism. And it's built on a patchwork of, of soft law. So in that sense, observing these these laws being developed even though we do see an increase in in corporate liability in all kinds of forms and a lot of norms we propose uh, together with um, law professors both in france and in the us we proposed um, a model i mean a tool i should say which is called the galaxy of norms which um, james kindly quoted in, uh, in his article in several places. And that galaxy tries to organize the space. It tries to show the distinction between what's voluntary and mandatory. And it tries to show that it, that distinction is eroding, that soft law are, are more and more shaping hard law and serves as an interpretation tool, as we've seen uh, most uh, strikingly in the Shell judgment last week and it incorporate norms by cross-reference. So what we, um, what I want, because there's so little time, what I want to um, show is the different models that are developing. There is a model that's based on compliance where you really apply the black letter of the law. 
that's the tendency of too many corporate counsel. They say we're not concerned with norms. We're only concerned with hard law. We don't have to look at norms because they're not real laws. They're not being enforced. And, and I challenge that. And I say, I mean, you have to have a much more governance, inclusive governance approach when you look at this universe that's developing. And the essential part of it is to engage with stakeholders and corporation and similar sectors and financial institutions to, to move this problem in a different direction. When rule makers are not only coming from sovereign states anymore, governance is producing norms at the same time. So the galaxy is designed to identify both hard law and soft law together and map their interaction and to sort the norms looking different and to show the kind of duty of care that's that's emanating from all that. So we're talking, I mean, we've elaborated five rings of liabilities, the first one being the hardcore hard law, the second one, the duty to report, and the third one, the duty of care or norm of behavior that includes case law, and which I call is a transmission belt from the outer circle, circle four and five, that brings them back into hard law. So the movement is that we see that soft law is gradually becoming hard law and needs to be looked at. And when I advise both lawyers and corporations, I tell them you cannot limit yourself to just looking at the black letter of the law because you'll be ill advising your clients or you'll take wrong decisions. There are many cases we can, we can name. Maybe one of the most striking one is the recent Juke and Gorges in, um, in, Aus in um, Australia, where they blew up caves after having eliminated the norms, decided that they wouldn't follow the norms, and several members of the board, including the CEO, had to step down. So the problem also with all that is, as we said, enforcement, but also remedy. I mean, the third pillar of the UNGP is, is very weak. Their remedy mechanism are not properly designed or are not addressing with sufficient strength the issues, as James pointed out so well. And in, in that um, context, I feel we have to press and put a lot of efforts into addressing the issue, both of enforcement and of remedies. And with the American Bar Association Business and Human Rights Project that I convene, we have worked in the last 15 months to um, to launch an, um, an access to remedy institute that Lisa is uh, very kind to post in the, uh, in the chat room and I'd be happy to answer questions. I am, I'm sure that's about all the time I have to, uh, to go on and I do want to leave the floor to, uh, to Luca to make sure that I don't overstay my welcome. Thank you so much for uh, giving me this opportunity to talk about, uh, well, to support James and to talk about some of the work uh, that I do. Thank you. Thank you so much, Elise. That was really wonderful. Um, but you mentioned something really important, which I'm hoping that Lucas can now pick up. Um, it's also been posted as one of the questions in the in the chat already. And, and the question is sort of, what can we realistically do about it? What, what are the, how can we get the remedies and, and how can we achieve accountability? Lucas, over to you. Difficult question, no pressure. Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, thank you, Lisa. I, I hope I can sort of answer that a bit in, in what I wanted to say, but most of what, I'm, uh, what I wanted to say sort of, I think, picks up on where, where uh, Elisa just, just stopped. So I think this disconnects very well. And I think I want to sort of highlight some of the, the, the details of uh, what she's been saying and also the interaction between developing norms and enforcing them, not just through public uh, instruments, which I think James already talked uh, a bit about, but also through uh, private litigation, which of course, and I'm going to sort of just keep that aside just for a second, but connects for, uh, very much also to uh, the rights remedy uh, and, and rights of compensation and, and so on. But we can maybe talk about that later uh, if there are any questions on that. Um, and, and again, before I start, uh, I want to thank James very much for a very uh, interesting, intriguing uh, and I think thought-provoking presentation. I mean, I've, I've read uh, his PhD uh, with a lot of interest. And for me, it's been 
sometime since I was actually conducting specific research into the private security industry. Uh, so some of the of the points he made were very familiar to me, especially sort of the the privatization movement and, and the boom that we had in the mid 2000s. But it's since I sort of stopped doing that research right around the moment the, the bubble burst and uh, the wages went bust and the, the real problem that we're discussing today uh, came came about it's very interesting to sort of get back into that discussion and, and realize what's happened since then and how uh, difficult these issues are and um i also wanted to say the points that i wanted to make are um necessary are, are much more about damage control than about problem solving and that relates a bit to the question of what can we do about it um because I think, as James already said, uh, and, and, and Mustafa also emphasized, that genie is out of the bottle. It's very difficult to get that uh, to get that back, to roll back time and, and start again with this whole question of, of who's actually responsible for providing security, who's responsible for carrying a gun, and so on. Uh, which means we're now at a point that everything we can do about it is necessarily reducing harm, but not uh, addressing root causes. And that's something I want to say is sort of like a preface, because... Uh, sometimes we as lawyers tend, uh, like to pretend that litigation and court uh, judgments are, are the be all and end all. Uh, and I'm certainly guilty of that as well. But that definitely is not the case, uh, I think, in this, this problem. Um, so, so a couple of points. Um, the first thing I noticed uh, and that I do want to highlight is that if we talk in, in sort of in business human rights land, we um, and I'm generalizing a bit here, but we tend to talk about different industries associated with very specific risks. So risks to the outside world, risks to the inside world, and by which I mean workers usually. And we tend to talk, for example, to, uh, about the, uh, the clothing industry as, some, as an industry that creates mostly risks for its own workers in terms of labor exploitation, uh, unsafe working environments. Uh, there's a lot of, lot of case law about that as well. Um, we tend to talk about, let's say, resource extraction as an, ex uh, as an industry creating external risks. Um, and again, this is generalization, but I've noticed that in most of the literature on um, the security industry, and this is why James's research is so important, we tend to talk about security as an external risk uh, creating industry, which I think as we've now learned, uh, hadn't, if we hadn't already, is not necessarily uh, correct, or at least it creates internal risk, risk to workers, risk of labor exploitation, as much as it does uh, to the outside world. And of course, the two are connected. Um, and, and I think that the, the, the farmer with a gun example uh, very much emphasizes that. But I think it's good to keep, keep that in mind. Also, when we talk about the type of litigation that would be informative of perhaps procedures against security providers, um, most litigation we've seen thus far was, is really about external risks. It's really about sort of communities um, being harmed by certain corporate activities rather than sort of systematic labor uh, labor issues. And in I think in business human rights in general, um, inappropriate labor practices, like basically everything up to modern slavery is not necessarily very well um, on the map. And I think it also feeds into uh, the level of regulation we've thus far seen because most of the documents that relate to the security industry really mostly talk about external risks, about uh, human rights situations that are already on the ground before security provider comes in, the type of environment that the workers operate in, um, the type of risks they can create by being their two external um, parties, which of course makes sense, but that also means um, we, in, in adopting new uh, regulations and adopting new legislation, we tend to lose sight of also the internal risks that, we, that we're discussing today. And I think if you look at how the EU and EU member states are approaching the security uh, industry, that is very much the case. So to take a very specific example, the Netherlands very recently, uh, the Netherlands is, is, is a bit of a laggard in terms of uh, allowing private security providers, armed security providers, but recently um, adopted a law allowing maritime security providers on Dutch merchant vessels. And if you see the level of regulation that sort of surrounds that, it's basically repeating the same mistakes all over again. Now, the legislation is not in, for in force, and I don't know uh, whether the risk, and I think also the risk that is very much associated with the UK and the relation it has with, its, its, with Nepal and other former colonies would be present in the same way in the Netherlands. It very well might, I, I don't know. But what you see is that the level of oversight, the level of regulation and, and identification of risks is really problematic. 
Um, we also, we, we have our, our, um, our own sort of business human rights, uh, corporate social responsibility uh, legislation, regulation, which and this is also interesting, identify specific sectors that are uh, at risk of creating security or creating human rights harms, but does not specifically mention the security sector, even while that law was, was being passed. And what I'm trying to say with this is that states uh, I think in general, with maybe the exception of the UK, which has this, this very developed security industry, are still not quite aware of uh, the depth to which the potential risks and the, the, breadth, the broadness of these risks go, and therefore are not capable of, of writing for specific norms. And if you then go to litigation, and that's sort of where I'll finish off, because I know I'm going slightly over time, you notice that the broader the norms are, the higher the, the, the threshold for victims to actually make that into a viable case. So if you have a very, gene a very generic norm, a very generic, um, so if you would express this in terms of English law, a very uh, generic duty of care, or uh, in terms of, of um, Dutch law, a very sort of open, a generic open norm, and you would have to address the particular risk you're running within that open norm, that puts a lot of burdens on the claimants. And, uh, in absence of specific cases that address these particular security issues or to address those particular security risks, I think it will still be some time before we see uh, these cases moving uh, moving in. Um, because again, the burden of, of, of showing that this particular company created the risk, they knew what they were doing, they knew how these recruiting practices were going, um, and connecting that to... Uh, either a hard law or soft law documents that also identify those sorts of risks, um, that's a big burden. Um, and if you look at, for instance, the, the, the climate case that I think Liz also uh, mentioned, the shell case we just had, one of the things that made that case so successful is that we had very specific documents already on what climate, uh, the, what sort of what corporations um, contribute to climate change. We had a case already, the Urgenda case, where the state was uh, held to a particular reduction norm. So all the, the, um, the litigants or the claimants in this case had to do was sort of take those already more specific obligations, apply them to the particular situation of, in this case, Royal Dutch Shell. So if we want to see more successful or the potential for successful litigation, I think that's really where the key is, connecting soft law norms to the appropriate risks and then connecting those norms and the identification of risks to particular cases. And that I think is uh, one of the main challenges uh, to progress in this area. And that's where I'll stop. Thank you so much, Lucas. Um, I just wanted to, um, before I pass the, the mic back to James, say that um, everyone is very welcome to use the Q&A function. I see we've got a, one question and, and one other in the uh, chat already, but please do use this time to um, maybe raise some questions that maybe um, may came up during the talk. Um, but James, did you want to take a couple of minutes to, to respond to these wonderful comments um, that have come from our panelists? Um, and I should also say, please feel free to, to plug your future work, um, because I know that you are possibly thinking about transforming this PhD into something that uh, can be shared with others, um, it possibly in the form of a book. So um, we'd love to hear your plans on that as well, James. Yeah, I might, I might give that a few weeks. I'll let my, my wife get used to the idea of me not spending every weekend wrestling with the complexities of, um, of outsourcing. <coughs> um, so, I mean, in terms of, I'll be very brief, I think, in my, in my responses. So firstly, can I just thank all of the other panelists for giving up their time and being so kind about, about my work. Um, you know, I really, really do appreciate um, their, their, their comments and, um, and, and particularly thinking about the work that, that Mustafa has been doing in the last, uh, how many years it's been there. He's been, he's been at the coalface of doing this stuff. Um, and I think all too often this debate is seen uh, through the lens of kind of the global north. And what I think is so exciting and interesting about what Mustafa and Equidem are doing is that they've, they've sort of turned the whole lens around and that they're bringing really high quality research and development work you know, from, from the, the, the grassroots up, which I think is absolutely critical. The number of times, I mean, I don't go there anymore, but the number of times I've sat in sort of UN type meetings or you know, other kind of uh, 
global uh, sort of institutional meetings where you just don't hear voices from the global south enough. There was a, a humorous incident. I remember being in Geneva a few years ago. There was a, an activist from Nigeria, very vocal. And she stood up and said, I'm the only black woman in the room. What is going on here? And she was right, you know, absolutely bang on. And I, I, I you know, like everyone else, I felt slightly embarrassed about my own presence there, but it's absolutely, you know, it's critical that this debate is not just, you know, confined to, to, to the sort of global, global north um, focus. So it's really important. Um, I, I didn't mention, I should have done, as an oversight on my part, I didn't mention the UNGP specifically, uh, but of course they are a really important framework and Elise picked up uh, on that point. You know, um, I don't want to give the impression that we haven't made progress. I think we've made extraordinary progress over the last 10 or 15 years in, 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 in lots of ways. I think we could do better, but I think we have made some extraordinary progress. And, and that changing of the conversation around norms and around um, you know, what we have the right to expect our governments to do, what we have the right to expect our contractors to do, how they should behave around the world. And it isn't some sort of neo-colonial interest of, of, of sort of white savior syndrome. It, it is a genuine uh, attempt, I think, to improve the terms on which global trade is undertaken. And I think we're actually at a really interesting moment right now. Obviously, we, we, we're in the, still in the grip of the pandemic. It's, it's tempting, again, from the sort of global north lens to assume that we're coming out of it. But actually, in many parts of the world, they're still very deeply in it. But hopefully, at some point in the next year or so, we will start to emerge from this, this pandemic moment. And the optimist in me likes to think that we could use that moment to retool some of these, these you know, global trading patterns and processes and to learn from the mistakes of the past and to be more engaged uh, you know, to be less um, careless about about how we we, we engage with, with the rest of the world. So, yeah, I mean that's that's my hope there. And and you know, Lucas's point about um, yeah about how we how we use the law as a as a positive lever of change, I think is really critical. And this is um, the law isn't always good at this. I mean, at, at the margins, I think the you know the activist lawyers, to use a sort of slightly pejorative phrase, have, have usually been quite good at, at this. But they are they tend to be on the fringes they're the people who don't have the funding and don't have the influence um which is a shame because actually you know, bringing cases like the one we saw in the netherlands the shell case absolutely groundbreaking you know we've seen the work of, of people like lee day in, in in this country you know bringing amazing cases we saw this morning the good law project challenging the government you know there are there are the law as a as a potential vehicle for for real positive social change is definitely a, a powerful weapon uh, but we have to we have to get in front of the agenda, I think. So I think that's really all I have to say. Unless there's any specific questions you want Lisa to put to me, or whether you want the, to open up to the to the, the floor, or however. Well, I, I think we do have another question that's just come through, which I think may be addressed uh, generally to the panel. Um, can we utilize the duties of individuals in the case specifically in the African Charter to extend obligations? onto jurisdictional persons. I'm thinking that's sort of states. In other words, can we create indirect application to respect and prevent interference of human rights by companies? Um, this does sound like a question that maybe may have a sort of a legal, um, need, need a legal frame um, around it. So I wonder if um, any of our panelists would like to tackle that. Um, selfishly, I'm also quite curious as to the scale of the problem. Um, and I wondered, you know, in terms of um, giving people an idea of just how large a population we're talking about in your case study, James, whether um, we can we can get an understanding of that. So these are my sort of two initial questions, one from the audience and one selfishly from myself. Um, does anyone, James, do you want to try and tackle that to start with? Um, yeah, I mean, so I'm just looking at, the, looking at it, uh, utilize the duties of individuals extend obligations onto jurisdictional persons and create an indirect application of respect. Yeah, um, I don't know <laughs> is the short answer to that. I mean, I guess um, the slightly longer answer is I do think that there are ways we can, we can apply a sort of direct effect. But I think we have to be smart about how we 
do it and it's not easy. Um, so I'm going to answer a slightly different question, which I do know the answer to, um, which is about Section 7 of the Bribery Act, which is kind of sort of doing the same thing. It's about, it's about trying to use obligations in a, in a slightly different way to the one that perhaps they were intended. Um, and in fact, Section 7 of the Bribery Act, which is the, the, the responsibility to prevent bribery, the corporate responsibility to prevent, is something that has, been, has come under quite a lot of scrutiny in, in recent years. Um, because it could be utilized in a situation like this to, uh, as a sort of generalized failure to prevent human rights abuses. Now, I know that the Bingham Center put out an, an interesting paper on that recently, and, um, and it's something I've been talking about for quite a while, because I do think that that that, that sort of failure to prevent thing is, is interesting, because it, it sort of partially reverses the burden of proof. And, and this sort of touches on the question, uh, question I think, which is about, you know, how can we how can we level the playing field a bit between claimants and and companies? Uh, I see Lucas has his hand up, so I, I'm really hoping he's going to come in and answer the question for me. <laughs> I feel like I'm touching the expanse of my knowledge. Here. Yeah, what I, what I think the um, the question we're first to. Uh, is Article 28 of the uh, African Charter of Human People's Rights, which very specifically codifies duties for individuals, uh, and, and I quote here, to respect and consider fellow beings without discrimination, uh, to maintain relations of promoting, safeguarding, and reinforcing mutual respect and tolerance. So basically, um, horizontalizing, in a very broad sense, human rights uh, obligations and, and human rights risks. Um, I'm not an expert on the uh, African Charter at all. So, I mean, I do recognize where this, where, where this comes from, um, but it would very much depend on how uh, specifically the African Court has applied this, this uh, provision. I don't know on the top of my head of any case where this has been applied specifically to corporations, but um, I think it's good to keep in mind that the African Charter sort of precedes the entire uh, Business human rights movement, and that, and that, in that's in, in in a way, um, you could say it, it also sort of paved the way for the idea that uh, human rights also include uh, sort of duties also for uh, for individuals. So I think everything we've been saying about either direct or indirect horizontal application um, sort of relates back to that idea that's already present uh, in in the charter. But then again, I mean, if there are very more specific interpretations of the African court or of any uh, domestic courts uh, of, of, of member states of the African Union, I'd be very happy to hear about that because, again, that's not what I'm an expert on either. Maybe to segue onto what Luca and James just said, uh, to my knowledge, the African Charter of People and Human Rights is the first international instrument that's trying to uh, to entrench the idea of, of uh, corporate liability of moral persons or jurisdictional person. There was a huge debate uh, around the creation of the International Criminal Court about creating liability for legal persons. Finally, it didn't go through. It was just focused on individuals. And from there on, I mean, there's been many judgment that really each time hit that wall of saying, well, we can find individuals responsible, we cannot find corporations responsible under international customary law. So I believe the charter of the African charter is trying to circumvent or, or modify that, uh, that discourse. At the same time, there was a recent uh, litigation in the US under the ATS, the Asian Tort Statute, and the arguments of, uh, it was in the case of Nestle and Cargill, that was, I think, end of November. And the argument of the lawyer for Nestle and Cargill was that since there was no liability of moral persons under international customary law, that case didn't belong to the Supreme Court, period, end of story, which generated a lot of kind of um, out, out time, I mean, a lot of anger and, and uneasiness on the part of even some of the extreme right-wing judges because they did give a legal personality to corporations to participate in election in the case that you all know, like Citizens United. And there were allegations that these corporations had been 
overseeing or just participating in child not only labor but torture so you have that kind of immense discrepancy and i do believe it will take both judgments and laws to to really incorporate legal persons as possible subject of law under international law but they are in national law so there you have a huge contradiction in most national systems corporate actors are liable to liability or to be sued like any individual person so we have a, a huge paradox here that needs to be fixed can i attack your second question lisa of course um size of the problem well it depends on what you're talking about and and sorry to be definitional but um so and it depends on what point in time you're talking about so if you're thinking about um armed guards in high threat environments then obviously that peaked during the height of the iraq and afghanistan conflicts uh, so at one point in iraq you had you actually had more contractors than you had troops in theater at one point which is historically pretty unprecedented in fact in afghanistan in the, in the drawdown years you had many more than two to one contractors to, to, to troops, which is extraordinary if you think that in, in Vietnam, it was sort of one contractor for every seven troops. Uh, is that right? Oh, there we are. Yeah, so, uh, so it, it sort of flexes with time is the answer. And it also depends on whether you're talking about, you know, uh, if you're talking about low level security guards, the sort of people you see on, on the gates in malls and shopping, uh, shopping malls in, 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 the, in the Middle East, who, who essentially are, you know, they're not really doing a security role. They're, well, they're sort of wandering around with a uniform on. But uh, if you were to include those people, then you're talking about you know, hundreds of thousands of people. Uh, Mustafa may have better figures than I have, but uh, you know, across the Gulf, there's, 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 there's a lot of those people. In terms of the embassy guarding, the specific embassy guarding work that I, I look at, it's a relatively small number of people. Um, they have to bear in mind that in the UK context, we have relatively few embassies that are in ultra high threat locations. So you know, Afghanistan is, is a very good example. And there's about 400, just under 400 um, guards on, on that embassy, uh, about 300 or so in Baghdad. And then you have various others around the world. But again, there are some private guards. But for the vast majority of embassies around the world, of course, they rely on local law enforcement or local, uh, lo local, local uh, assets to, to protect the embassy. And that usually works very well. So it's only in situations of ultra high threat that you tend to get either Royal Military Police or Special Services or now outsourced uh, security providers providing those, those, those support services. Um, the only other thing I was going to say was um, in the US context, it's, it's quite different. So the US has had a sort of ideological commitment to outsourcing for a lot longer than, than the UK. And it, you know, it's, it's a truism that the US military really can't go to war without KBR or Dyncor or Fleur or, you know, those are the guys who basically do all of the, the facilitating work for the, for the armed forces. And so there are just tons of contractors in that space and they do all kinds of things. Security is just one of them. They also do dining facilities and trains and housing and all that sort of stuff, right? But, and again, you know, the, the, the cadre of um, armed security is a sort of subset of the general security, which is already quite small. But you know, we're certainly talking about um, you know, globally, it's, it's in the tens of thousands, I would say, of sort of um, armed security guards operating for contractors on behalf of, of, of governments. Now then, and, and then of course, you've got all of the unlicensed uh, mercenary types who, who tend to hang around in slightly more ungoverned spaces. Um, so yeah, right now, you know, in the UK context, it's probably a couple of thousand. In the US context, a, 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 a few more thousands or tens of thousands. Not certainly not millions, but at the height of the Iraq and Afghanistan conflicts, you were talking about you know, large numbers, you know, pro probably hundreds of thousands of, of armed contractors. Um, in, in in that sense, I don't know, Mustafa, do you have any better idea of the sort of lower level security guard uh, numbers? Um, yeah, so I don't have the exact figure to hand, but you're looking at in the certainly the tens of thousands, say in the Gulf, if you look at it globally, then you're looking at hundreds of thousands, because also what you have is the, um, the sort of really insecure locations and zones of armed conflict, which have security guards, but in fact, in many parts of the world, practically every part, uh, and particularly in countries and cities which have sort of high crime rates or not very safe. 
um, there's a proliferation of private security. So if you go like to anywhere between Johannesburg or parts of the United States, um, or if you go to most emerging countries um, in the banks, for example, they're everywhere. So in fact, the, I don't know if there's an exact number out there, but you're looking at in the hundreds of thousands of, of workers. So it's actually a very large um, workforce. Mm, I was going to say that, that is quite a sizable um, you know, population of people. And it actually brings to mind, um, at least in sort of my, from my part of the world, is sort of the Australian context where refugees are, are sort of under the, the control and, and you know, care of uh, security companies and private companies. Um, I don't see another question, but one of the, the second part of a question that came up in the Zoom chat earlier is how can we hold the media's attention for this type of issue? Because, you know, they do provide the odd headline and it creates a certain level of outrage, but it doesn't last. Um, and then sort of add a, as a tack on to that, again, sort of private, you know, selfish reasons, but I'm quite interested to know whether there are in fact um, sort of really subtle nuanced differences between private procurement and public procurement, whether there are characteristics that actually make them different. Um, sure, can we have a go at that? Thanks, Jane. Okay. Um, uh, media. Um, well, so I'll give you an example of how difficult it can be to engage the media on this stuff. And one of the reasons why I, I prefer to speak um, sort of naturally rather than to, to, to give scripted talks is because I think we have to be much better at telling stories around this stuff. We've got to be much better at humanizing why this matters and, and conveying, to, because ultimately these are problems that often manifest themselves thousands of miles away from where the sort of media saturated environments are. Yeah. That, that, much as modern slavery is a, or call it modern slavery, the issues around slavery like practices can be problematic in the UK, and there, no doubt there is a problem here. It's a relatively marginal problem. It's a problem put within the criminal justice sort of bucket, and and, and then sort of left there. But actually, the the sorts of uh, institutionalized failures that we're talking about here largely manifest themselves in other parts of the world. So it can be quite difficult to engage people's attention for that. I'll give you an example. So when G4S was the subject of a hostile takeover at the end of the last year, with two companies involved in trying to buy it. And we, uh, obviously through my research and but also through uh, our sort of general practice of these, uh, understanding these things, and people like Mustafa have a, a better idea than I do. You know, we knew that there were some significant problems within the G4S supply chain. And none of this was, was, was secret, right? This had been published in the Norwegian report and elsewhere. And there, there were these two companies bidding to buy it. And they were both either fully or partly private equity backed um, US or Canada based companies who were gonna come in and buy this enormous security company with 600,000 employees. Um, and they had these problems and we knew they had these problems. And so um, myself, Mustafa and others tried to put together a sort of letter writing campaign to, to the various newspapers to say, we want to highlight the fact that this is problematic and we'd like government or the regulators to step in and make sure that this new company that comes in fixes those problems because they're not historical, they're still happening now. And yet, even, the, even though this was, this was the biggest security company in the world being sold, even though the problems relating to that company were fully known in the public domain, we could not get that, pub that letter published. Partly because of the fear of, of being sued and partly because people just didn't think it was that big a story. And I thought, well, how, how big do you want it to be? You know, you've got, as Mustafa's research shows every day, you know, tens of thousands of security guards. We know from the Qatar reporting, tens of thousands of people being exploited across the Gulf. And the company that is ultimately responsible for a lot of those workers is being sold to another company that has almost no experience actually in that part of the world. And yet, zero interest, even from media outlets who you might think would have been more friendly to us. You know, I didn't, I didn't expect to get much headline work from the Sun or from the Daily Telegraph, but to not get anything from the Guardian or from, you know, other forms of media who might, you might expect to have been more human rights friendly was interesting. And so I do think that challenge of, of, of how to tell those stories is really important. 
Um, on the point of public and private procurement, I mean, public procurement is very particular, as you say, and the government is the, usually the biggest buyer of goods and services in any market. It's also the rule setter. It has to go through often legislative, legislatively defined processes in order to, uh, to, 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 to give out contracts. But those processes are often overseen by relatively junior procurement people who often move departments every three years. And so they don't actually have the institutional memory of how to do this um, in a compliant way. And especially if the rules are moving on. A private private um, uh, uh, procurement is either good or bad, depending on how the company views these things. And it will be, you know, some companies are very responsible in their sourcing and, the, and, and, their, and their procurement. Some are, uh, as Elise said, a black letter. You know, tell me what I can and can't do. I will do what I can do and I won't do what I can't do. And don't tell me about nuance or subtlety or norms. I'm not interested. Tell me what I can do and I'll do it right up to the letter. So I noticed Mustafa had his hand up there. First of all, Sorry, I was... to say, um, you will have the last word on this. Um, so as with all these things, that as soon as the discussion gets really interesting, I think we have to end, unfortunately. So over to you, but um, you'll have maybe about a, a minute or two. Thanks, and sorry, it's a function of not finding the button, which is the virtual hand on the thing. So sorry for the old school method. Um, just a really quick point to say that, um, look, we've talked about a lot of challenges, but in terms of solutions, I think, a really key thing is worker organizing. So there's already a union, Uni Global, which is actually the, the global representative trade union body for the security sector. But also beyond that, thinking of innovative and new ways to have worker representation and then promoting worker voice, that's really key. So I think it's a really big challenge. Um, and also that it's about maybe not one solution, but finding little types of solutions. So in some contexts, it is litigation and that sort of a thing. I think James' point about the lack of media interest is a really good one. But then also there are maybe opportunities working with governments, with, with companies to make them recognise that they're actually dealing with it. Actually, what I would describe personally as a human rights crisis. It's actually a human rights crisis with these, with these security guards. Um, but yeah, that's, that's it for me. Thank you so much. Um, I think, I mean, this has been really fascinating for me and particularly as I want to pick up on James's last point as well about um, sort of the, the the hurdles that often public procurement requires the act actors to go through, that is some somewhat of a difference. Uh, and there's sort of quite real barriers in, the, in terms of legislation. That's something I, I definitely learned today. I'm, I'm looking forward to continuing our discussion, hopefully um, via email. Um, James, congratulations on your doctoral work. Um, it is wonderful to have these issues highlighted. Um, and to all of the panelists, um, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for not only sharing your expertise with us, um, but also for the work that you're actually doing on the ground, um, whether it's business and human rights or whether it's you know really sort of campaigning. Um, fantastic to have um, such a wonderful community. Um, and Oxford was really lucky to, to be able to host you today. So thank you to the audience for joining us. Um, it's been a really fascinating discussion. Thank you all so much. I'm going to end the webinar quite abruptly now, but you can expect an email from me um, to the panelists. Thank you again so much. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks Bye a lot. Now.